Is divorce and remarriage a sin? Should anyone ever remarry after divorce? What does the Bible say about divorce? Are there new insights on divorce and remarriage that are keeping with the spirit of the scriptures? What are the answers for those individuals who are desperately searching and trying to survive bad marriages and come to pastors for guidance? As the divorce rate soars in our society, not sparing Christians, certain questions demand a correct and biblical answer. When divorce is granted, the two people part their separate ways. Likely, sooner or later, one of these two people who have been given a divorce will walk up to you and say, is divorce and remarriage a sin? We as stewards of the Word of God, we must be prepared to answer this question. Under no circumstances may we view the situation and grant this question an answer that would violate the Word of God. What did Jesus really mean when he said, except it be for fornication? Perhaps you have asked this question many times or have been asked its correct meaning. For some, the Bible answers to this question will create within you a complete rejection, some a confirmation of your belief on the subject, to others, peace of mind you so desperately want. As we begin this small study, we will give special attention to the original words for the meaning of adultery and fornication. The questions asked are very deep and controversial ones, but the Bible gives a definite answer for each. Many of us have been to weddings, and many of us are married. And if this is the case, you'll remember the words that were read to you by the minister officiating your wedding. To the man, he told him to repeat, Will you take this woman whose heart you have won, and whose confidence you have cherished, to be your wedded wife, to live together in holy matrimony? Will you love her, comfort her, honor her, keep her in sickness and in health, forsaking all others? Cleave only unto her so long as you both shall live? And then to the woman the minister turns, and he said to her, Will you have this man? whose love and confidence you have won to be your wedded husband, to live together in holy matrimony. Will you love him, comfort him, honor him, keep him in sickness and in health, forsaken all others, cleave only unto him so long as you both shall live? The main question that arises today when we ask the question, is divorce and remarriage a sin? The question is, what is fornication? The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 32, saving for the cause of fornication. What did Jesus mean in Matthew 5, 32? But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. What is the true meaning of the word fornication? It appears from this verse that Christ forbid divorce as a general practice, but allowed divorce if fornication could be proven. In Matthew 19 and 9, Jesus further said to the Pharisees, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery." Here again, Christ used the term fornication and said that fornication was the only excuse one could have for divorce. Is there a difference then between adultery and fornication? For the most part, the contemporary thinker says that there is no difference. But how did Christ arrive at two words? Are they one and the same? Why did Jesus mention both terms? Does the scripture differentiate between fornication and adultery? The purpose of this part is to raise the question of the meaning of fornication and to point out the controversy of its meaning. The following parts will develop this question, define fornication, and give us biblical references. Why did Christ mention both fornication and adultery? Why two words? Hebrews 12 and 16 tells us less there be any fornicator. The book of Revelation chapter 2 verse 22 says, Cast them that commit adultery. 
The five words, except it be for fornication, which was spoken by Jesus, is surely one of the most misunderstood phrases in the entire New Testament. Around the phrase hinges the right for one to remarry if he has been divorced. Christ, and later Paul, speaks on the subject. Both Christ and Paul treat adultery and fornication as two separate terms. Christ, as already seen, speaks on this subject in Matthew 5, 32 and Matthew 19 and 9. And Paul speaks of it in Galatians 5, 19 and in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Jesus briefly mentions the two terms in his comments, but Paul explains the two terms more explicitly by explanation and illustration. For a quick glance of these two terms in Paul's writings, note how the apostle regarded adultery and fornication as two distinct and separate terms in the Galatians account. Galatians 5.19 says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, comma, fornication. And in 1 Corinthians 6 and 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, comma, nor idolaters, comma, nor adulterers. Why are these two separate terms found in Paul's two separate lists of these sins of the flesh. Could it be that he sees two different meanings or understandings? Can we expect to hear from him later in Scripture as he elaborates on the reason for listing adultery and fornication twice, as if to point out or emphasize some difference between the two? The original Greek word for fornication is pornia, which takes in the following definition, an illicit sexual intercourse. Likewise, adultery comes from the Greek word mohios and normally means an unlawful intercourse with the spouse of another. What then can be made from the different words with both literally meaning the same? They are different in spelling, but the meanings are related. Because of failure to clearly define between the two words by scholarly books today, many ministers, pastors, and teachers have maintained an erroneous understanding of the meaning of Christ's words, except it be for fornication. Too many denominational pastors or teachers were ignorantly advised their members or counselors to remarry, not knowing the true meaning of the two words. The consequence for this is that many people will remarry with some thinking that they have the biblical right to do so. What then is the real significant difference between the two words when the dictionaries declare that they are the same? Let us go to the Bible and see what were John's and Paul's beliefs concerning divorce and remarriage. Romans chapter 2 verse 22 tells us, should not commit adultery. It has already been said that Jesus spoke of the sin of adultery and fornication and that Paul mentions the two terms. Let us note the illustration of former pioneer A.J. Tomlinson, first general overseer of the Church of God and how he used to teach the meaning of the term fornication. John Jensen married Sally Pratt, who had a living husband, and that John Jensen is free to put her away and marry another because he has no wife. He had another man's wife in fornication. Now his explanation on his position. Now Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 and 2, in giving special instructions, says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, comma, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. The thought here is not that it is necessary for every man to have a wife, or every woman to have a husband, in order to avoid fornication, but that each one shall have their own and not the husband or wife of another. Paul did not say, let every man have a wife and let every woman have a husband. He said, nevertheless, to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Note that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, for a further understanding of this truth, 
Paul says it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Paul goes on and tells the Corinthians how to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. This Corinthian couple was committing adultery, all right. And this, however, is the fornication that differs from adultery. It is fornication, then, for a man to have another man's wife, or for a woman to have another woman's husband. This analogy is so plain that it cannot be questioned by an unbiased and unprejudiced mind. Now note what John the Baptist says about this subject in the gospel according to Matthew chapter 14 verses 3 and 4. This great man of God was beheaded because he reproved Herod the king for living in fornication. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. Mark 6.17 said that Herod had married her. These verses show that Herod was living with another man's wife. It helps us to see that fornication is living in an unholy matrimony with another's companion. So this shows us that God is against fornication and explains why his prophets speak against it as such a sin. Now turn your attention back to Paul. When Paul found the fornication in the Corinth church in 1 Corinthians 5 and 1, he, like John the Baptist, reproved it. Like John who found the king married to his brother's wife. Paul found a son living with his stepmother. Paul goes further than John and offers the remedy or solution for removing the fornication from the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2. Paul tells the church to use the radical discipline and excommunicate the sinners. Fornication is treated by Jesus, John the Baptist, and Paul as sin. The Bible states that fornication or fornicators shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It follows then that having another man or woman's companion is living in fornication. It is impossible for a sincere believer to feel that he can enter heaven if he is a fornicator. What then is fornication? Fornication is not a simple act of adultery, as so many mistakenly believe. Fornication is the sin of a person who has another person's companion in the unholy relationship of man and wife, even if the court decree it. Fornication involves a vow. So let us remember, Christ, Paul, and John the Baptist spoke on the subject of fornication. All objected to fornication and pronounced it sin. John the Baptist felt so strongly about the sin of fornication that he gave his very life to warn the king of the great sin. As John the Baptist saw it, the king was in gross error and sin because the king was living in fornication. Just because he was the king, Herod could not have the law changed so he could justify his lust and desire. Paul spoke out about the sin of fornication at the Corinth church. He said to avoid fornication, each married man or woman was to have their own companion, not a divorced companion of someone else's. Now, the question arises, what then is adultery? The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 20 verse 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. The original word for adultery has already been studied. The word for adultery denotes an illicit intercourse between two unmarried people. It can be psychological or physical. Physically, adultery is the sexual act between any man and woman not lawfully married to one another. But Jesus explains it further and said, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Matthew 5, verses 27 and 28. May we notice whosoever makes no difference between the single and married man and no difference between the single and married woman. Christ's views on the sin of adultery have never changed regardless of the permissive society. 
premarital relationship between marriages tends to break down character and ideals and greatly jeopardizes the marriage, while adultery after marriage is the ruin of everything holy and good in marriage. We must fight against adultery without apology, since the Bible deals so frankly and so repeatedly with the subject. Note the Bible coverage on this subject. In the book of Genesis, the Sodomites, Genesis 19, 1-11. Lot's incest with two daughters, Genesis 19, 30-38. Judah's sin with his daughter-in-law, Genesis 38, verses 12 through 30. Potiphar's wife's seductive attempt of Joseph in Genesis 39, 7 through 20. We continue to read Joshua, Rahab, the harlot, in Joshua 2. In Judges, Samson falls for a fallen woman in Judges chapter 16. Second Samuel, David's sin with Bathsheba in Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 2. As we continue to read in Romans, in chapter 1 records the fall of a race of savages because of God's judgment upon their sexual perversion. In Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 32. In the Apostle Paul's epistles, warning after warning are given against adultery. In the book of Revelation, Babylon's predicted ruin due to adultery in Revelation chapter 17. Finally, after a glorious picture of heaven, we are plainly warned that whoremongers and adulterers are outside in Revelation 21 and 8. Honest people need to teach against this sin because, number one, millions of people don't realize how horrible this sin is in God's sight. Number two, people underestimate God's judgment of this sin. And number three, teaching and preaching on this sin creates an acute consciousness of God and leads to conviction for sin and to repentance. Now, if Christ, John the Baptist, and Paul use sharp, plain words that cut people to their hearts, why should we not be honest and frank in dealing with the adultery issue? Pastors today need to be able to instruct their congregations on wholesome reading material and able to warn their hearts against the reading of filthy literature and of things that are going on on TV and social media. Adultery is not a tribal sin. It is one of the most terrible sins against God. Four Bible evidences show God's attitude on this subject. Number one, in the book of Exodus chapter 20 verse 14, adultery is forbidden in the Ten Commandments. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 20, verse 10, this would be number two, that adultery required the death penalty. Number three, adultery brought on disease, according to Deuteronomy, chapter 22, verse 22. Adultery will lead, number four, one to hell, Proverbs 7, 27. Now, is divorce wrong? The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1 and 3, Write her a bill of divorcement. Since a discussion has already been given on fornication and adultery, one now asks the question, is divorce wrong? Can I remarry? The Bible teaches that the marriage union is binding until death of one of the individuals. The school of Shamor, who lived a little before our Savior, taught that a man could not lawfully be divorced from his wife unless he had found her guilty of some action which was really infamous and contrary to the rules of virtue. The school of Hillel, who was Shamar's student, taught on the contrary that the least reason was sufficient to authorize a man to put away his wife. For example, if she did not cook his food well, or if he found a woman whom he liked better. Now the Pharisees tried to trap Christ and attempted to make known his feelings as to which was correct. He instead taught that adultery could be committed in the heart and no marriage could be dissolved except for fornication. Paul later said that death could render a marriage void. A divorce does not give an automatic right for one to remarry. While the courts are quick to give divorces and the procedure is lawful, God does not give one the permission to remarry. In Matthew 19, 4-6, the Bible says, Have ye not read 
that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Notice that it is what God joins together that cannot be put asunder. The marriage ceremony by the proper authority makes the couple husband and wife, but God makes the one flesh. Only death can separate the union. One may unbiblically break this covenant through a rite from the court, but the one flesh continues until death. Have you ever sat through court proceedings and listened to the courts as they granted divorces? It reminds one to some degree of an auction. Many times, it is hard to tell what action was even taken. Many couples are run through like animals as the judge listens, signs, and makes certain remarks. The whole scene is both sickening and repulsive, besides being, except for fornication, totally against the holy word of the Almighty God. No court has ever had the power to break up a vow that joined two partners together, regardless of the laws and the many amendments. Marriage is until death, except fornication. Paul, like Christ, wrote about this subject. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband, so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Romans 7, verse 2 and 3. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 and 11. Paul, like Christ, spoke plainly and with authority. To paraphrase it, he simply said to the wife to stay with her husband, but if she departs or divorces, she must remain unmarried or return to her husband. In our divorce-plagued society, some teach that God does not recognize marriages if the marriage flops. Some have even said that they were not really meant for each other. Some pastors, when asked, Can I remarry? will say, Yes, since you were not meant for each other, go ahead and divorce. This contemporary or modern counseling is biblically wrong. A marriage may flop, but the vow that was made between them in the presence of one in authority is recognized by God, and the vow which makes one flesh of the vow makers is written in heaven. Only death can break that seal. Christ said, let no man break the one flesh vow that was taken. Many interpret, what therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder, to mean that God joins a man and a woman together in marriage as husband and wife. But God does not marry anyone. The laws of the land and the man having authority who says this ceremony and pronounces them husband and wife do that. The thing that God has joined together is the fact that when they are married properly and lawfully, they are one flesh. They are no more two, but one flesh. Please notice that it does not read them, therefore God has joined together. The correct reading is not them, but what they're for. That is, God said they were one flesh when they married. Since they became one flesh, they have to remain one flesh, because God has never changed it, and man is without authority to change it. So when they are married, they remain one flesh and married till one of them dies, because God has made it so from the beginning that husband and wife are one flesh and man cannot make otherwise. Pastor, can I remarry? Well, what is the reason you want to be remarried? Well, you see, I caught my husband in the very act of adultery. Well, said the pastor, you have the right to do so. But wait a minute. The Apostle Paul says, What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot, whore, or whoremonger is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. In 1 Corinthians 6.16 6, The pastor must say no, except for fornication. 
No man has a biblical right to divorce his wife if he catches her in the very act. He can divorce her only if she has a lawful husband yet living. Pastor, can I stay married to the man I am now living with, even though he has been married before? You see, he and I both have just prayed through to the Holy Ghost, and we both want to join the church. Well, the pastor says, God has forgiven you, so the church has no other right but to forgive you too. But wait a minute. Jesus said, and he told the woman that was taken in the very act of adultery to go and sin no more. While God will save, sanctify, and baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire, one who is living in fornication, God teaches the newborn believer to forsake sin. But not only forsake sin, but to also resist the devil. Neither give place to the devil. In other words, remaining in the same marital status, sharing roles of mutual love will force the newborn believer back into sin. It's good to note this in the Gospels of John, chapter 8, verse 11, in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 7, and also in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 17. The pastor must say no, except for fornication. The Bible teaches restitution too. The new believer, if he wants to keep his Holy Ghost experience, must divorce the woman and be restored to his lawful wife. In a recent study that was done, it was said that 40% of marriages end up in divorce. I believe that number has risen more higher today in our present time. Churches in various cities are changing their teachings to meet the abrupt changes in the home situations. Children from broken homes view older people as mothers or fathers to compensate their loss as one of their parents. The divorced spouse says the hardest problem to combat is loneliness. The fifth year of marriage is the year most likely to end in divorce, statistics say to us. Possible causes for divorce is a woman's liberation principles or a woman feel that they can make it alone. Divorces are more easily obtained and courts no longer require that one of the couples has to prove adultery, cruelty, or argument. Irreconcilable grounds used for divorce is easiest way to do it today. 80% and even more today of the women remarry in their first three years and also men. So this discussion points out that marriage is a lifetime contract. It should never be broken. In the teaching of the Lord Jesus on the question of marriage and divorce, several plain facts stand out. Facts that should never be forgotten. Number one, one comes to marriage leaving father and mother and all else. The husband is to cleave to his wife, according to the Gospel of Matthew 19 and 5. Number two, of man and wife, it is said, they shall be one flesh. Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. And number three, God himself seals every marriage till death. Matthew 19 and 6. Now to conclude lost love and happiness in a failing marriage, both man and wife must look to God to determine to keep their home in place, maintain their vows and ties at any cost. Homes need to be built around the husband and wife, not the children. Both husband and wife need to be born again, sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, the unhappy home should turn to the word of God in prayer. The unhappy home can often find sweet happiness when children are born into the home. The husband should be the spiritual leader of the home, and the wives should reverence their husbands. Both should love one another and express their love to each other often. Ask God to create in you a love for your companion. God can restore the love and happiness of marriage if men and women are willing to come to God. The divorce speaks of man's way and tends to leave God's principles for marriage. Remember, marriage is binding until death breaks the vow. Divorce should be avoided if at all possible. If divorce is sought and forced upon one by an unbelieving husband or wife, the divorce party cannot remarry. Paul counseled the divorce party to be reconciled, remarried to each other, or the possibility of adultery could arise. Marriage erupt in fornication born. Paul would speak out against the permissible rules of our society today. 
This country's laws govern those who will not take the Bible and be governed by it. No law can change the mind of God. So in view of everything that we have studied, it is clear to us that God's word, the Holy Bible, teaches against this sin of divorce and remarriage. I pray that this small Bible study has been a blessing to your life and also a time of reflection and of studying of the word of God.